When it comes to old retro consoles, the PlayStation has a special place in my heart. With its low-poly models, low texture resolutions, and a plethora of hardware limitations, it has an aesthetic that just screams nostalgia to me. It's also a style that is commonly replicated by game developers, particularly horror games. Lost in Vivo, Siren Head, and any game made by Puppet Combo all try to mimic this style. And if you're reading the title of this video and watching, you already have this question in mind. How do I create PlayStation 1 graphics in Blender 2.8? Well, to get some disappointment out of the way, you can't. Not perfectly, anyway. But that doesn't mean you can't get close. Blender as a tool is far more advanced than the capabilities of the PlayStation 1. Things that are essential to the aesthetic, like a fine texturing where the textures warp based on perspective, or the checkered dithering filters that try to break up limited depth of the PlayStation 1, are obsolete, and I simply can't find a way to replicate them. And many people have tried to find ways, forum posts all over show that. Unfortunately, as of right now, there is no answer to that. But then again, when we look at the games that I've mentioned earlier, they don't perfectly nail the aesthetic either. So, with that in mind, I'm going to take a minute to redefine the aesthetic that we are creating. The style that we're going for is what I call Low Fidelity 3D. It's an homage to the retro styles of old 3D games, which we will utilize low poly models and low texture resolutions, but we can also add a little bit extra seasoning for flavor and extra details. And, just like how low fidelity music implements certain imperfections to achieve a certain style, we're going to attempt the same thing using different tricks. So before I start this tutorial series in earnest, I want to set a mantra in place that you should remember. If nothing else from this tutorial series, if you remember this mantra, I feel it'll keep you in the right mindset and keep you on track to make low fidelity 3D. Remember, make more with less. If there's any way to reduce complexity, any way to cut corners, and keep the level of detail that you want without destroying your model or topology, do it. You want to reduce the amount of work for yourself, not make it harder. The nature of low fidelity 3D is based on imperfections and distortions. Since we're looking at old gaming consoles, we have to consider their limitations and follow them accordingly. So for this introduction tutorial series, I'm simply going to give the basics. This is necessary for any scene you want to recreate in this style. So, when we open up Blender 2.8, we're going to change a few things right off the bat. We're going to spare the default cube. He gets a bad rap and it makes him sad to get deleted all the time. First things first that we need to change is the render resolution. The PlayStation 1 has a native resolution of 320 by 240 pixels, so we're going to do just that. We are going to click on the Output Properties tab, the little printer icon here, and we're going to change the X resolution to 320 and the Y resolution to 240. Now if we hit F12 to render, we will look at the result. Obviously the resolution has changed, but if you notice, there's a noticeable blurring effect around the edges of the cube. The PlayStation 1 or any retro 3D consoles don't use anti-aliasing to hide the sharpness of their models. More importantly, I'm pretty certain they couldn't even use anti-aliasing even if they wanted to. So, neither are we. We can turn this effect off if we go back to our Blender screen and we click on the Render Setting button. The white camera icon here. We find the Film drop-down menu, open it, and then we set the filter size to zero. Now, if we render it, we immediately see that the results are sharper and they look more authentic. Now, there is one more thing that I want to do to get the best possible low-quality render. Blender has a natural dithering filter that attempts to break up color banding by adding noise to the filters and making textures look smoother. The PlayStation 1 also uses a dithering filter, however, the style of that filters are lost here. Their filter incorporates a checkered board, and Blender is far more subtle. So, since it's not nerf, it's nothing. We are going to turn it off. On the Blender screen, click the Output Properties again, and scroll all the way down to the bottom of that menu. At the bottom, there's a drop-down titled Post Processing. Open it, and you'll see the dithering option. We're going to set it to zero, and when we render it again, you will probably not notice anything at all, or be able to tell the difference between the two renders that we just made. It's very subtle, so I'm going to show you like this. Here we have two renders I just did side by side. I adjusted the level so you can see the dithering effect better. The rending on the left has dithering effect turned off, and on the right the dithering is turned on. It's personally a stylistic choice, you can either leave it on or leave it off. You might give you the effect you want depending on what you're going for. However, when I have such low render resolution, I want to keep my colors as not distorted as possible. Only on my terms will I have dithering, and that's what texturing is for. Speaking of texturing, let's talk about textures. I'm going to go into texture paint mode here, and since the default cube starts with a UV projection, we can jump right into texturing. First of all, we need to create an image file to hold our color data. 
So we click on the new button here, and this is where we will talk about texture resolution. On the PlayStation, the highest resolution texture that you can have is 256 by 256. So that's exactly what we're going to type in. For the sake of the demonstration, we're going to generate a UV grid. I don't feel like painting today, so this should show off the depth of the cube well enough. We're going to give this texture a name, something you can hopefully easily remember. Click on the text field here that says Untitled and type something in. I don't really care what you name your texture, but I'm going to name mine Steve. Now, to apply the texture that we just generated, we need to tell the cube how to use it. To do this, we're going to go over here to the Materials tab, this circle with a checkered pattern on it. And here, this is all the information about the surface of this cube. We don't need any of this, really. If you want to stay authentic to the old consoles, they didn't have bump mapping, roughness, metallic, or any of that stuff as far as I'm aware. Remember, we need to make more with less, so let's simplify this material. We can click here on the Surface menu, and we can change this to a Diffuse BSDF. This is as basic as a shader as you can get. Now to apply the texture. We can click right here on this dot next to the current base color, which opens up a drop-down menu. And here we're going to select Image Texture. Finally, we need to pass the texture information that we just generated over here. We click on this drop-down button and select our texture, Steve. Now, there's one more thing that we need to fix before we consider this material finished. Take notice that this texture is slightly blurry. This isn't Steve's fault, he's nice and crisp over here in the image editing view. The material is reading this and being told to blur it. Normally, when you're texturing something that's more higher quality, you want this because you are, again, trying to make more with less, and blurring the textures make them look higher resolution than they actually are. However, the PlayStation didn't have texture filtering, and so we want to texture them sharp here. Let's change this by going over here and changing the texture interpolation value. It is currently set to linear. We want to set this to closest, and now we have our cube perfectly textured the way we want it. Let's talk about animation now. I'm not going to get too far into this, we're just going to keep it simple. I just want my cube to rotate around 360 degrees. Now here's the question. If you want to animate in this style, what frame rate should you use to render them in? I have a few animation demos here I'm going to play side by side to maybe help you decide for that yourself. Personally, if you'd ask me, I'd prefer 12 to 10 frames a second. It simply feels better to me for some reason. I'm pretty certain that the PlayStation 1 could handle up to 30 frames per second, and probably 24 frames per second for heavy 3D games like Vagrant Story or Metal Gear Solid. However, 12 frames per second seems to be my standard, and it's what I've been using for the longest time for my animations. After all, consider you're probably not even going to be able to capture all the detail of the smoothness that 60 frame rates would even provide and only make your render take longer and more space. If you're going to do action, or something that has high detail movements and you need smoothness, I would suggest 24 frames a second, but don't go any higher. And with that, that's the basics. That's really all you need to get your scenes to have that retro look. I want to make more videos of what you can do to make models and scenes in this lo-fi style, but I also want to make something that you guys want to see. I want to take a minute to ask you guys a direct question. Where do you guys want to see these tutorial videos go? Do you want to go sci-fi? Fantasy? Modern? I want to build something that you guys want to see and hopefully help people make art in a style that they enjoy. I want you guys to post in the comment sections what you want to see me make for this tutorial series and be sure to subscribe for further tutorials and I'll see you guys next time. And remember, make more with less.